Hello and welcome to History 4. I'm so excited to have you back here today for another episode. Today's episode we are going to focus a little bit on Anne Boleyn and in particular the swordsman who performed the execution. This is really quite a unique sort of story and a unique circumstances surrounding the why he was chosen and where he came from and and who chose him and all those sort of things and I'm really excited to delve a little bit deeper into that. If you don't know, Anne Boleyn was the second wife of the notorious King Henry VIII. He was well known for his torture and for his many wives and for all the executions that he carried out or signed the warrants for people's executions. He is most particularly noted for executing two of his wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. But today we're just going to focus on Anne Boleyn and we'll deal with Catherine Howard another day. I won't do too much of an in-depth history about Anne Boleyn because there are plenty of other videos where you can go for that. But I really just am going to focus on the swordsman and her execution. Anne Boleyn was tried and convicted for treason and incest with her brother. She was later found innocent of all these crimes but I think Henry just really needed a reason or an excuse to get rid of her and he just threw whatever he could that he thought might stick and the treason and the incest was, were the ones that stuck. She was also convicted of being adulterous and having many other lovers who were all beheaded and executed because of her, their relations with her, which in turn turned out to be false. Ordering a swordsman from France was actually quite unique because at the time executions were usually carried out with an axe and they didn't routinely order swordsmen or any executioners from outside of the country. They were usually just within the country and at the Tower of London and things like that. So Henry particularly getting a swordsman from out of the country and finding a particular swordsman. This swordsman was well known and well renowned for his, for his skills. Also the method in which the swordsman executed a person was quite unique. When you use an axe the person would lay down and they would place their head on a block and the axe man would lift the axe and chop. But when you were beheaded with a sword, you would kneel upright and the sword would come from behind and cut your head off like that. So as I read and researched about this swordsman and about the method of execution, I came to two conclusions. Well, there are two sort of main theories as to why Henry VIII chose a swordsman rather than just using the regular old executioner that he has used for all his other executions. The first theory is that he had some compassion for Anne. This is the theory that has been around the longest and has been the most widely accepted. The theory goes that because he had so much compassion for Anne and because he still loved her that he wanted it to be a quick and a seamless and as painless as possible for her. This doesn't really seem true after you learn a bit more about Henry VIII because he doesn't seem to have an ounce of compassion and love in his body to be honest. Executions during this time which were usually completed with an axe were routinely botched and they could be messy and quite painful and I don't think Henry wanted any sort of compassion from other people towards Anne. If the execution didn't go well and it was botched then there could be an uprising of people feeling a lot of sympathy for Anne and uprising against him and his position and his the love of the people towards him and his respect would be would plummet and I don't think he wanted that. I think he needed it to be a nice quick execution because it would be the least tainting to his reputation. Some of the notable executions during this time that were botched were Mary Queen of Scots and Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury. Mary Queen of Scots, she was executed by Henry VIII's daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, and when she was executed they chopped with an axe and it took three goes before her head was removed from her body. The first blow didn't kill her at all, she was still alive and she cried out, sweet Jesus. And then the executioner went again and he still didn't make the cut all the way through and so he had to go for a third time and on the third time he was just hacking away at her, at the sinew that was still connecting her head to her body. After he had finally completed the job, he held up her head, which was customary, and said God save the Queen, meaning Queen Elizabeth, but the um, Mary Queen of Scots, she wasn't wearing, she was wearing a wig and her head fell off and it rolled into the crowd and her lips were still moving and it was terrifying. Oh my gosh, can you imagine if you were in that crowd and they held up a head and it just like rolled into the crowd in front of you and its eyes were open and lips still moving. That would have been terrifying. I cannot even imagine. I don't want to think about it. So that was something that Henry really wanted to avoid, I think. 
Another notable execution that went wrong during Henry VIII's reign was that of Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury. Her crime was supporting the Catholic Church and she did not go to the scaffolds quietly. She was an elderly woman and she put up a fight and I'm so proud of her. Everybody else seems to just go so dignified and quietly to the scaffolds and I don't know how they do it. So I'm so proud of Margaret Pole for just standing her ground and not not going quietly. So she had to be forced down onto the block and when she was executed they used a novice axeman so he was not skilled at all and it took them it took him 11 goes before he finally completed the job so he hacked away at her back and her head and her neck before he could finally it took 11 goes before he could finally actually finish the job and that was just horrible i can't imagine sitting there or standing there in the audience and watching that and not feeling some kind of compassion for this lady and i really think this is something that Henry VIII wanted to avoid with Anne Boleyn. These uh, Mary Queen of Scots and Margaret Pole, these are executions that we know about and are well documented, but I am sure there have been lots and lots of other executions that were routinely botched that Henry VIII knew about and he really just didn't want that for Anne Boleyn because he didn't want any kind of compassion or any kind of love shown towards her. He didn't want any kind of love or compassion shown towards Anne because that love and compassion could have a negative effect on him and the people thinking less of him. Because he wanted her to be seen as somebody who was an adulteress, someone who had defiled their king, somebody who had been treasonous and incestuous and all these bad things, where well, she really wasn't, but that's what he wanted the people to think so he could justify why he, why he was um, executing her. We will now move on to the second theory which is that King Henry VIII was obsessed with King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and Camelot. The story of King Arthur is intertwined into Tudor life all the time and it is no surprise that King Henry was obsessed because his father also felt that he was a direct line and direct heir from King Arthur himself. There is currently a round table sitting in Winchester Castle that is thought to date back to Camelot. Henry had this table painted with King Arthur bearing Henry's resemblance. Henry felt that he was, in fact, King Arthur's heir. Many historians believe that King Henry VIII chose the sword as a symbol of Camelot and not as an act of grace upon his wife. They posit that Henry cast himself in the role of Arthur, and while sparing his wife as Arthur did from death by being burned at the stake, Anne was originally sentenced to death by burning, as was the sentence for the day for women convicted of treason. Anne was evidently cast as Guinevere. The sword is a symbol of King Arthur's reign. It is a symbol of masculinity, of honour, of everything that King Henry VIII valued and admired. During Anne's trial, his masculinity was placed on the block, so to speak, as the accusations of Anne's infidelity and numerous affairs cast aspersions on Henry's ability to perform his husbandly duty, so to speak. He tried to counter these aspersions by surrounding himself with many beautiful women and making grand displays of his prowess with the ladies. Perhaps there is some truth to his lacking in the bedroom, as he and his fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, were never able to consummate their marriage. By casting himself as Arthur and saving his wife from a more crueler fate of being burned to death by fire, he showed a lot of compassion and chivalry and honour, which is just how King Arthur would have acted. But the truth is, he wasn't doing it for Anne, he was doing it for himself. He was just doing it to save faith, and that is what I wholly believe. The act of having a queen executed was novel, it was unprecedented, and I think Henry VIII was just unsure of how it was going to affect his popularity. Anne Boleyn was given a trial and she performed exceptionally. She did not leave any doubt that she was innocent. She provided all the evidence that you could possibly need to prove her innocence. But she was still condemned to die and the trial was just made, merely a matter of process. Henry VIII had actually, before her trial, he had sent for the swordsman. He was going to execute her regardless. There was just no doubt in his mind that she needed to be gone and he was going to do it. So he had ordered the executioner before she even went to trial, which really shows that there was no compassion left for her. He just wanted her gone and he was going to get her gone one way or the other. Who was the swordsman who executed Anne? There is no knowledge of the identity of the swordsman who executed Anne. This is not unusual though, as the identity of the executioners was kept hidden so as to protect them from retaliation from the families that they chose to execute. What we do know about the executioner is that he was famed for his skills. His reputation preceded him. 
Um, he came from Calais, which at the time was an English territory in France, or in modern day France. But we're actually unsure if he was from Calais itself, or if that is just where he was working. But we know that he, they sent for him to come from Calais, so he left from Calais to come to to England to do the execution. Being an executioner as a profession has to be difficult. I can't imagine it being a nice profession. I imagine they are paid pretty handsomely though. But this executioner really struck me as somebody who had a lot of compassion for Anne and that he was actually really, really kind. And he did a lot of little things to make the horrible event a lot nicer for her, which he really didn't have to. He was going to get paid either way, really. I want to talk about the little things that he did for Anne that made a huge difference. Even though they were just little simple acts of kindness, they really made a huge difference to her, I'm sure. Um, one of the first things that I noted in the research that I was doing, that he didn't wear really loud clopping shoes. He wore really soft moccasins because, as you can imagine, when you are blindfolded and when you're laying down there, or sitting ready to have your head removed from your body that you really don't want to hear like the big clip clopping around of shoes. It's going to be quite unnerving and quite scary I think. So I think him keeping it as quiet as possible and as gentle as possible by very nice soft shoes so he, she didn't get startled was just a really kind gesture of him. He also brought along with him sear cloth. This is a wax cloth that was used to wrap the body after burial. This is not a privilege afforded to those executed by the English. The executioner then provided her with a cushion on which to kneel. In one last act of mercy, the swordsman called out to the side and said, Boy, fetch me my sword. And as he did that, he actually collected his sword, which he had hidden under a stack of hay, and performed the execution. So while he was performing the execution, Anne was distracted as she looked to see where the sword was going to be coming from. And I think that is one little act of kindness that made a huge difference because she was distracted. She didn't even see it coming. And I think that it just shows so much compassion and kindness on his part. Another little tidbit which I found quite interesting was that he didn't hold her head up for the crowd to see. He just simply collected all his bits and pieces and he collected her overcoat. As was also tradition, the overcoat that Anne wore was part of his payment for his duties. But the government paid him to have it returned because they didn't want any souvenirs surrounding uh, Anne Boleyn's execution and all her bits and pieces were mostly burned so that there were no souvenirs to remain. It really goes to show that this executioner had a lot of love in his heart and he was not a cruel and callous man who just enjoyed executing people for the fun of it or for what it paid. I think he was genuinely a kind person and he showed a lot of love for Anne in what was obviously a very terrifying and scary part of her life. It was the end of her life and she knew that she was innocent. She had not done anything wrong but she was there and she was going to pay for her life and it was scary for her and he did all these little things that made it all that little bit easier for her. Um, it appears that Henry didn't really make any provisions for Anne after she was executed. Her body was quickly bundled up by her ladies-in-waiting and put into an arrow chest and the sear cloth just put over the top. Her body wasn't wrapped or prepared or anything like that. And she was taken and she was interred in the Chapel of St. Peter at in the t at the Tower of London alongside her brother, who was also executed the day before her. There is so much that we can learn about Anne Boleyn, and in particular her death. It was very unprecedented for a king to execute his wife and or execute his queen. And many were unsure of whether he would go through with the actual execution. And he did, and I think that gave that a lot of people a lot of worry because if he can do that, what can he? What else can he do? What else is he capable of? And it shows further on in his reign that he is really capable of a lot of horrific and horrible things. Um, he would execute another wife, um, Catherine Howard, which was also traumatic, and the way that he treated her after she was dead was also horrible. I think there are still a lot of questions surrounding the swordsman of Calais, or the swordsman that executed Anne. I would really love to know a lot more about him. I would like to know who he really is, what his name is, what else he did. Was he only performing executions? Did he do other duties or was he just known as the executioner? Um, did he travel around Europe performing executions? Is that how he was so well known? I don't know. I would really like to know a lot more about him. But it, it is also understandable why we don't know a lot about him. If you were an executioner, would you like people to know who you are or what your profession was? Probably not, especially if you had executed a queen. Anne Boleyn's story continues to interest people the world over and it has so many different facets to it and you 
just can't know everything about Anne Boleyn. There are so many book, different books about her. There is movies about her. She was a remarkable woman and I'm so thankful for the example that she has led and for the stance that she made and I hope that we can learn a lot more from her because she is just incredible. And that is where I'm going to leave it with you for today. I hope that you can go out and research a bit more about Anne Boleyn. Look for new videos, look for books about her. I'll leave some of my favourite books about Anne Boleyn down below because she is just such a great person to research and to learn more about. You will never ever get bored about learning about Anne Boleyn. There's a great podcast called The Talking Tudors and she loves Anne Boleyn and there are so many amazing episodes on her podcast about Anne Boleyn. And yeah, absolutely, just go and watch it because you will love it, I'm sure. And even if it's not Anne Boleyn that you love, she has so many amazing interviews with historians and incredible people who just know so much more about these sort of things than I do. I just do this for a hobby. I just love learning about historic people. But I'm and definitely, okay, I am going to leave it here. This is where we are leaving it. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day and I will see you again later in the week.